Well, this week, The Communicators wraps up its visit to the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, where we talked with policymakers and tech company executives about the intersection of technology and public policy. And we looked at some of the latest technology on display by some of the 3,000 exhibitors. This week, we'll look at some of that technology as we visit some of the exhibitors' booths. Well, The Communicators is on location in Las Vegas, Nevada at the Consumer Electronics Show, which is held at the Las Vegas Convention Center. But even in the parking lot of the Convention Center are some more exhibitors. And joining us now is Joe Atkin, who is president of a company called Go Goal Zero. Mr. Atkin, what is Goal Zero? We are a portable solar manufacturer, so we make uh, portable solar products that charge everything from like cell phones to laptops to refrigerators. And uh, we were started in Africa, but we're selling here in the U.S. now. How did you get started? Uh, humanitarian efforts. And so uh, our founder, Robert Workman, was over in Africa finding ways to help people create jobs and looking for needs. And one of the first needs that came up was everyone has solar or cell phones, but no one has uh, uh, power. So he said, well, if I can get you some power, could you guys sell it? And so, yeah. So uh, that's what started creating some jobs over in Africa. Now, are, you, are your products all on the market? They are. And we're releasing some new products, as we typically do at CES, you know, but um, you can find them in great retailers, Costco, REI, Cabela's, Best Buy, Bass Pro Shops. So, yeah. Well, show us some of your products. What do you got here? So we have kind of a small, medium, large. So here's one of the small systems right here. This is a 7-watt solar panel with a little battery pack. So this collects the power, and then you can charge your iPhone, cell phones, all that kind of stuff directly. Or if you want, you can, you can store your power in this little battery pack. It's the only one like it on the market that has uh, AA batteries. So it charges, you can pop them out, put them in like a flashlight or whatever. And it also acts as a power pack. So you can charge any of your devices right off of there. Plug your cell phone, you'll never be without power. What would this cost? Um, 159 MSRP. Really? Yeah. And uh, where is it manufactured? We manufacture everything in China. And everything's designed here in Utah or in the United States, but we produce it all in China. Okay, what else do you have here? So if you want bigger than like a cell phone or a smartphone charger, we have a laptop charger. This is this one an Innovations Award at CES. So you can have this little guy. You'll never need a power um, outlet at an airport again. So you can carry this little thing with you. You got all your plugs just to plug your laptop in, or if you have an iPhone or iPad or you know Galaxy or whatever you have, Droids. Everything charges right off of here. You can even charge um, your laptops directly right off of this product. And so it's small, it's portable, weighs like a pound. You can put it in your laptop bag and, and you're done. Joe Atkin, what if you're in a place where there's no sunshine? So it, they also charge off the wall um, and they also charge off car chargers. And so um, if there's no place where there's, with, I guess if there's no sun, that's a pretty dark place because they also charge off of cloudy conditions or if it's rainy. So even like our users in Europe or uh, London or UK or whatever, they, they can power it up no problem. So it doesn't have to be totally sunny like it is right now. Um, it just it can charge in cloudy conditions as well. How long will it hold a power charge? If Let's say you charge it for three hours in the sunshine and then yeah. you travel? Yeah, and so typically uh, rechargeable batteries like this will last like four to six months. Um, just on the shelf. And so it's kind of like a battery in your car that you want to be using it. Um, but this will char this will power a laptop for a couple hours. It will recharge an iPad a couple times. Or if you have like um, a small a smartphone, two to four times, it will recharge it off of one charge. And so if you're traveling around, you could just tra uh, charge this up from your uh, house, like a wall plug, and take it with you on a plane or an event. And if you're away from the sun, that's when you just pull out the solar panel and it just recharges it. So what do you do? With, just a few hours. What do you do with this thing? All you have to do is just lay it out in the sun like this, and then you plug this into the to the battery pack, and it just immediately starts to charge. There's no delay or anything, and it's waterproof. How long would would it take to fully charge this? Six to eight hours, depending on the sun. So this is yeah. So when you look at the emissions and greenhouse environmental issues. Yep. Even though these things still use electricity, are you saving, are you cutting down on emission? Yeah, of course. You know, I mean, that's one of the great advantages of solar panels is the solar panels that we see like on roofs, they're rated for 25 years. So you buy it and you can use it for 20 years. Um, and so it's, 
I mean, obviously it's cutting down. That's why it's gaining more popularity. Plus prices have come down. So a panel like this used to sell for $600 and now they're $199, you know, and that's been in the last two years. So it, is that uh, technology changes? Is it uh, more consumption? Is it, what about government grants toward the, these products? It's really all three, you know, so things are getting more efficient. So they're getting smaller. Um, the volumes have increased because of that. And uh, the government has been subsidizing, you know, um, they, they don't necessarily subsidize for the small portable stuff, but they do for homes. And so we benefit from that because of the increase in volume. So what else do you got here? So if you're looking for more than like a cell phone or a laptop, something like, let's say a refrigerator for emergency preparedness or a base camp or cabin, uh, we're releasing this. It's called the Yeti 1250. This is just releasing at CES this year. It has, it can basically power anything your wall outlet in your house can. And so uh, refrigerators, we even ran some sub zeros for a couple days off of one charge. And so you've got all your AC ports. So like a wall plug, you can do hair dryers, anything you want, uh, USB, 12 volt. And then uh, it's got a lot of smarts and circuitry to protect the battery. And, and um, here are some of the solar panels. This is one of the smaller ones, but um, one of the cool things about our solar panels is they're all chainable. So you can start with one and then you can just daisy chain as many as you want together. So if you say, hey, I want to crank this up in, I want to charge it in two days or I want to charge it in one day or half a day, all you have to do is just double the solar panels. And uh, so this is basically power on the go, power anywhere, really. What does Yeti sell for? Uh, it's $1,500 MSRP. And it's the uh, first silent generator on the market. So this is, it's an indoor generator, really. You can use it indoors, no gas, no noise. Um, so yeah. Why not manufacture in the United States? It's purely cost. You know, we'd love to if we could, but it tripled the cost of the products. And I think, you know, when you're selling consumer products, it's like everyone here at the Consumer Electronics Show, you'll probably find five or 10% of people that can actually make them here. So it's just, the uh, U.S. is not a manufacturing country like it used to be. Joe Atkin is the president of Goal Zero. What's your website? Uh, www.goalzero.com. That's G-O-A-L, like the soccer, and then Goal uh, Zero, Z-E-R-O.com. And The Communicators is here at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, Nevada. Well, one of the exhibitors here at the Consumer Electronics Show is a group called Life Technologies, and we are joined by one of their directors, Graham Scott. Dr. Scott, what is Life Technologies? What do you do? So we're a leading provider of technologies um, to biomedical researchers, people who are actively um, working in life sciences, performing research. We sell uh, to government labs, academic labs, pharmaceutical companies. It's primarily researchers who are expo exploring biological questions. And how do you, well, first of all, how long have you been in business? Oh, well, Life Technologies um, has, as, as an entity, has been in business, uh, I think, a little over two years, but, the, but the, the, the genesis of the company actually goes back over 25 years because Two major companies for, uh, were the, the, the companies that came together to, to form life technologies were Applied Biosystems and Invitrogen. And so they date back over two decades. How do you use technology in your work? Uh, so again, technology is used um, by scientists who are posing questions about disease. They want to understand the biology of disease. Um, typically, they're working with samples. Um, give you a concrete example. So they may be working with cancer cells and also control cells and they're asking biological questions about what's different in the cancer cells from the control cells. What do you have on display here at the Consumer Electronics? Okay, so what we have on display is our new proton uh, sequencer which is very transformative. It uses um, completely revolutionary technology that's based on a chip actually a semiconductor chip. And we like to say the chip is actually the machine. And so what you're seeing here on this chip in this racetrack pad, and you're actually seeing um, an area that has 165 million wells, each of which can sequence a small piece of DNA. And so what we can do is we can take DNA from a human sample or really from any organism, and we can chop that into little pieces and we can via a series of fairly simple molecular biology steps, we can deliver 
those DNA constructs onto this chip and all the really interesting work happens on this chip. Now, if you put it in the machine, what happens? Okay, so I very simply put the chip in the machine and, and I actually close, uh, close this lever down. And what we're able to do, the principle of operation is actually very simple, Peter. It's, uh, the, what happens here is we actually introduce um, reagents, we actually introduce nucleotides. There are four bases in DNA, A, C, G, and T. And as we introduce those, in this, and as we sequence, what actually happens is a, is a charged, um, a charged ion is released. It's actually a hydrogen ion or a proton, hence the name of the instrument. So a proton is released as we sequence, and that has a charge on it, and we're simply able to measure that charge. By measuring that charge, we can actually determine um, the sequence. We actually see the chemistry in real time by measuring that charge. So what are the practical applications of this, Dr. Scott? Yeah, as I've said, it's primarily biomedical research. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out is the, the uh, smaller version or the kind of the little sister to this instrument is called the personal genome machine to give you a, a concrete example of what that was used for and it uses the same type of semiconductor sequencing. You may recall the E. coli outbreak in Europe of a few months ago. So the personal genome machine, which again is the predecessor to the proton, was used to very rapidly sequence that pathogenic E. coli bacterium obtain the full sequence so that a screen could be rapidly developed and we could do that all in just a few days. So the utility of this technology is it's very, very fast. So is this technology on the market? So we're taking orders right now from, uh, from, from customers. Such uh, as? Uh, such as, again, primarily biomedical researchers. Um, we expect to be in full commercial release by the end of the third quarter and we'll be doing some early access about the middle of the year. So, Dr. Scott, how are you funded? Is this a venture capitalist type funding? Oh, no, we are, um, we, we are, we are listed, uh, we're, we're a public company, so, yeah. So, we're, we're, yeah. Life Technologies is the name of the company. What's the scientific American that you have up here on your? Yeah, so at this booth, we were able to um, have a very, I think, productive partnership with Scientific American. Um, both in terms of this particular booth, but also in terms of some other wider activities here at the CES meeting. So it's a very quickly. Partnership. What's your background? My background is I'm a, a chemist, actually a physical chemist. Um, so I've worked a lot in sequencing over a whole decade. In fact, I was involved in the Human Genome Project um, ten years ago. So my background is, is chemistry and been in sequencing for about a decade. We've been talking with Graham Scott of Life Technologies here at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. And here at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas is a Quality of Life Technology Center. It's a National Science Foundation Engineering Research Center. And joining us now is the director of the Quality of Life Foundry, and that is Kurt Stone of Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Mr. Stone, what is the Quality of Life Technology Center? It's a research center that's focusing on creating intelligent systems for seniors and people with disabilities. Uh, using robotics, robotics technology, vision technology, uh, looking at the human side of things with the Institute on Aging at the University of Pittsburgh also, and uh, engineering research labs. And um, it is focusing on creating the smart systems, not necessarily the hardware all the time, but the smart systems that will help people live and extend their lives in their homes longer. And this is something that's done at Carnegie with the assistance of the University of Pittsburgh? They're a partner in our research center. Uh, it's very collaborative. We're right next door to each other. We're basically a budding campus. It makes it very easy. It's a good collaboration. Well, Mr. Stone, you've got two things on display here. You've got a computer running that we want to look at, and it looks like a crash helmet. Could you tell us what these are? Yes. Well, this, this is for our first application of this technology, is in the sports uh, media side. Uh, but the, the technology itself is using two cameras, one that looks out and one that looks at the eye. So we know exactly what the person is interested in in the scene that they're seeing. When you consider people monitor, being monitored to understand what they're, what they're doing and tracking them, uh, having cameras on the outside looking at them is very intrusive. But people tend to not be concerned about us seeing or the computer seeing what they see. 
In order to do that, in order for the computers and the intelligence systems to help people, you have to know exactly what their interest is. So this is what it does. The eye tracking system exactly points to, and you can see the target on our system itself, on the computer, uh, it's a little red circle there. It's showing, this is a driving application, or someone driving using it, and it shows exactly where the person's looking as they're driving. So we can see their eye down here in one camera, and this is where they're looking with the red circle, correct? Exactly, and this is just to show, we don't necessarily sh always show the eye, but that shows how we're tracking the eye, just for a demonstration. What's the practical application of that? Well, there are many practical applications. If someone who has Alzheimer's, we can incorporate it into a facial recognition system, or someone who has a, a condition called prosopinosia, which is face blindness, which is actually significant in the, in the world. Uh, over 2% of the population has that. Uh, where it can actually, you look at someone, help the, help the systems identify who you're looking at, pull that information out and put it into the recognition system so it tells them who it is. So audibly, they can, it can tell you, that's John Smith, you met him two weeks ago, or that's so-and-so, it's doing this. We can also use it for object recognitions, for, for patients, older patients with TBI or Alzheimer's. If they have trouble as they're doing things, I do it periodically myself, start, start something in the kitchen or somewhere else and sort of lose track of what I was planning on doing, this system, by understanding what they've done so far, seeing that, identifying the objects and understanding the actions that they've done, we can then help them with coaching as to what to do next so they don't get stuck and they don't get frustrated. Do you see a product, this product, coming out in the market at any point? Very much so. It's actually a spin-out from the Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, the first market, as I mentioned at the very beginning, is using it as a media for sports. Uh, we're also doing security applications, and uh, this show has been extremely helpful and, or surprisingly helpful, many different applications coming out uh, beyond the healthcare, which we're looking at, uh, into the gaming space, into the military space, into the even aeronautics, uh, doing everything. It's a, it's a base technology that, that is very interesting. What's the work that you do with the National Science Foundation? How much money has been put in by the NSF? As an engineering research center, it's a 10-year program with $40 million that's funded by the National Science Foundation. A certain amount every year. Uh, it's part of it's contributed, or some money is contributed by the universities as matching, as well as some industry partners that we have that donate money uh, to us. And we also get other funding through different grants that we write and, and try to uh, continue to raise that. We've been talking with Kurt Stone of Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, but we also want to meet a University of Pittsburgh student, and that is Elaine down here. She's with the University of Pittsburgh, I should say. This is Elaine Houston. And uh, Ms. Houston, what's your role at the University of Pittsburgh? I'm a PhD student and also a graduate student researcher. And why are you here at the Consumer Electronics Show? What are you demonstrating? I am here demonstrating PERMA, or the Personal Mobility and Manipulation Appliance. Where was this developed? This was developed back at the University of Pittsburgh in conjunction also with Carnegie Mellon University. Could you demonstrate what this does and how it helps you? Yeah. One of the tasks this one could do is potentially, I've dropped my pen and it's picked it up and now I need to get it back to me. And so I could have the hand come in and bring me the pen. Can you swing it in? Sorry. And this is being operated. This is being operated robotically. Is that correct? Open the gripper. Wheel. Yes, it is. And so, is, now, is this a product that could be on the market at some point? Very much so. We're we're very much hoping that this can be actually commercially available within the next couple of years. What else does it do? It looks like it has cameras here on the side, along with the uh, the grippers. Yeah, the cameras are actually to allow somebody to remotely operate this device for me if I were not able to operate it myself via some local controls. Now, are you disabled? Yes, I am. In what way? I have multiple orthopedic impairments which require me to use a power wheelchair. And now, is this wheelchair yours or is this still a demonstration chair? This is still very much a demonstration chair, but I'm actually working with this chair much of the time. Are you part of the development process at the University of Pittsburgh? Very much so. A lot of what we do is very much bringing users of the technology to get them to help provide feedback on which way we should be going and what we should be doing and how we should be doing it. What would you like to see changed or developed on such a chair? 
I think the big part is the local user interface, how the person actually interacts with this chair independently without the aid of a remote operator. And being able to independently do the, even the simple tasks of life, opening a bottle and variety, picking up a pen you've dropped on the floor. Elaine Houston, PhD student, PhD in? Rehab Science. At the University of Pittsburgh. The Communicators is at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Well, one of the items most frequently on display here at the Consumer Electronics Show 2012 in Las Vegas is 3D TV. And we are joined on the Communicators by Heidi Hoffman, who is the Managing Director of the 3D at Home Consortium. Ms. Hoffman, first of all, what is 3D at Home Consortium? We're a membership organization, about 50 member companies who are interested in, all in accelerating the adoption of 3D into the home and beyond. Uh, we were formed about four years ago. Uh, our, our members are all active members that work on different parts of the industry, different parts of the, what we call the 3D ecosystem, whether it's broadcast, content creation, uh, 3D products for the home consumer products, or whether it's research studies on how 3D is working for people, what, what needs to happen and what they like best. Are we in second or third generation 3D yet? Good question. Um, I think we're still first generation products. If you, if you evaluate 3D by active televisions, passive televisions, auto stereo, glasses free, you know, we've certainly, we see the technology changing, we see it moving, we see a lot happening, and I think it's really, uh, you can see it here at the show. What are you displaying here at the Consumer Electronics Show? So for the first year, we, we've been here about two other years, we, all of our member companies came together and wanted to show you know, the breadth of 3D. So we've got products that'll show up in your cell phone. We've got 3D products that are showing up for your entertainment systems. We've got 3D software that's showing up in what we call edutainment, right? Education and entertainment combined. National Geographic, Discovery, those kind of channels have always done it really well in HD, 2D. Well, they're getting in the 3D game. Um, and plus we have some other software applications. So you, you're gonna see 3D in classrooms because it's really incredibly, um, the numbers, the, the, we've done some studies on this. Uh, it's amazing how much better students focus on the subject and how much more they take away. And it's been tested over time that this continues to happen. Students are really getting engaged in 3D, particularly in math and science. Now, are we at any point going to be able to lose these, the, uh, the 3D experience glasses. Absolutely. I think we're going to see here at the show a lot of advancements in auto stereo. So we've already losing I'm these sorry, in... auto stereo, glasses free, auto stereo. Um, you're, you're going to see as you look around the show um, uh, monitors that work in, in uh, without glasses. You're going to see especially any single user system. So cell phones in 3D, absolutely. Your 3DS and the Nintendo gaming system. Um, those kind of um, uh, technologies have really taken off and have are advancing. I don't think you're going to see it yet in the large screen. You'll see some uh, some sh some um, demos here on the show that do uh, are in auto stereo, large screen, but for yet those aren't quite to the consumer market yet. What about these laptops, Heidi Hoffman, that you have on display here? Are these 3D laptops? This is a 3D laptop uh, showing an NVIDIA um, gaming system. Uh, right now we're feeling through some still videos, so or still uh, images. The, um, these still images, I think, illustrate really well what you can do with user-generated content, right? Someone went to Paris, took this picture, Someone who didn't go to Paris is going to get a much better sense of what that looks like at the Louvre. Who are some of the companies that are members of 3D at Home? All right, well, uh, here at the show we're partnering with Samsung, um, Volfoni, NVIDIA, uh, Spatial View, um, Master Image. So we've got large companies that are very, you know, have advanced products, edu edu entertainment products in 3D, and we have small products like, or small companies like a Master Image, for example, that has a, that'll be putting displays into your cell phones. Of course, there's some already, but uh, their auto stereo technology is just a slightly different, slight different twist. It gives a, a great uh, 3D view on your cell phone. Where are you based and what's your background to get into this? I'm in San Jose and I manage consortiums. So I've been involved in that for about 25 years, well, 15 years before that with the U.S. government. So 
bringing people together, communicating, moving in industry faster because we're together rather than moving separately. Of course, you can go much faster when you're sep when you're a lone company, but you'll find your your roadblock is there. Much you're going to hit it much faster than if we go together. Heidi Hoffman is the managing director of the 3D at Home Consortium. The Communicators is at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, Nevada. And the Communicators continues its tour of the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, Nevada. The Mobile 500 Alliance is here and John Lawson is the executive director of that alliance. Mr. Lawson, what is the Mobile 500? It's a consortium of 47 broadcast companies. We own 430 television stations across the country and we're dedicated to taking advantage of the, the tech, technology breakthrough that allows us to use our over-the-air television signal for mobile devices. What does that mean exactly? If I'm here in Las Vegas, how would I use your device? If your cell phone or your laptop uh, is enabled with either an adapter or a built-in receiver, you can get live television over the air through that device without touching your data plan um, while you're making a phone call. It's, it's a way to get very high-end uh, video to your device cheaply. So the broadcasters are launching free channels to be received over the air and what we're demonstrating here today is a consumer product, uh, an Apple adapter that will go to an iPad or an iPhone that allows you to receive over the air television. It allows you to, it's got a DVR built into it. Uh, you, can pause, uh, you can pause the programming and take it with you and then uh, we've got a, a, a solution through 3G uh, the, the, the wireless network is integrated into that into a single uh, user interface. So, Mr. Lawson, again, I'm here in Las Vegas. Could I watch the three broadcast channels or what, you've got all your member companies down here on your display, but what exactly could I see if I were right here? Could I watch local TV from Washington, D.C.? You could watch local TV from Las Vegas. So, this is a local play. We'll have national content, of course. We've, we have the Food Network uh, here for the booth. But it's the local broadcaster, and what we found is that people value the local news, weather, and sports most highly. Perfect. So, people who may be interested in watching C-SPAN, would C-SPAN have to sign up for your service for uh, people to get that over their mobile devices? It all depends on our deal with C-SPAN. We would love to have C-SPAN in. Everything we're broadcasting now is free and in the clear. Uh, if C-SPAN, we would love to have C-SPAN in our portfolio of state of stations and channels that we're building. So, Does um, it include the broadcast networks, ABCs, NBCs, and CBS? It does. There's a, there's a second consortium headed by Fox and NBC, and they're lighting up their stations, the NBC, uh, Fox, and Telemundo stations across the country, and they'll be broadcasting content from those stations. Where's your device manufactured? The, uh, the companies that are designing it are in Israel and Germany, and uh, it will be manufactured probably in China. Well, we're also joined here at the booth by Brian McHale, who is the Vice President of Technology for Fisher's, Fisher Communications out of Seattle. Mr. McHale, what are you going to demonstrate for us today? Well, what I want to show basically here is, again, live television over the air from a station locally because in of Seattle. This device here. That's correct. Now, that's the Ciano accessory with a chip in it to pick up over the air content. Um, so we've got, uh, you can see we have basically the guide here itself. Uh, various stations are broadcasting clear to air, which we can pick up. Uh, for our demonstration, we have MyTV, the CW, the Food Network has graciously allowed us to, to uh, distribute their content, and the Country Network. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to drop into MyTV right here. This is, this is an iPad that we're demonstrating. It's an iPad. Uh, the application was built by a company called Elgato, uh, again with the Ciano accessory picking up the signal. So you can see this is live television over the air. There's Maury. There's Maury. Now what's interesting here is if the question we always get is how can we drive revenue from this application? Well what you see here as you flip through the channel we actually have an interstitial which gives the opportunity to drive advertising revenue from the product itself. And as we move forward again more interstitial as well. Uh, the country network is there. And that's to go back to the food network. And when does it pop back up? How long? It'll pop back up here in a second. 
Uh, we've got some program guide information below to show exactly what you're watching. Uh, now what's interesting here, I can tap the screen once and I can actually hit this red button right here and I'm actually recording that show right now over the air. And it'll record onto your iPad? Yes, it records locally to the storage on the device itself. And when I'm finished recording my clip, I can touch the screen again, hit that button there, and actually the recording is now completed. Is this, market, uh, is this product right here on the market now? And if so, what does it sell for? It's not available in the U.S. market yet. Uh, Ciano is committed to a launch this year. They are ready to ship. Uh, they do have the product in Europe. Uh, the European market has got it uh, extensively. This is uh, not the latest and greatest, but the, the next version of this will not have a telescopic antenna, but basically the antenna in a small wire, so it's actually lighter and actually easy to, to take with you as you, you know, within your, your, if you're outside and you want to actually pick up mobile over the air television. Why did you start the uh, product launch in Europe? Uh, well, Ciano's already been in that market already, so we basically brought them in to help us, and they, they definitely want to get into the U.S. market with their devices. They want to see this succeed for broadcasters. So they were a great partner in, in stepping up, providing 10 of these accessories for us for the, for the show itself. And we've been talking to the folks at the Mobile 500 Alliance. And you've been watching the communicators and for the past five weeks we have been showing you our visit to the consumer electronics show in las vegas if you'd like to watch any of these past shows or any communicators go to cspan.org communicators